I'm going to invite Edward and Mr. Jenkins, once they have some refreshments, to rejoin us here. In the front, I'm also going to invite up Dr. Brent Wilson, who's going to lead us into the second portion of the program. Please join me in welcoming them. appreciated that, that talk, and so for the folks in here that do know Edward, um, it was just, it was incredibly touching. I imagine the ones that, of you that have touched him personally in some way um, in his life and been a part of those six years, it's especially rewarding for you to hear the successes that he's made. I just wanted to touch on a few words that kept coming up, and I'm going to conceptualize um, the experience of Edward and put it in a bigger perspective and talk about trauma as a as a bigger issue, whether it's neglect or whether it's overt abuse, whether it's witnessing things or actually having direct experiences. Those words that um, came up a lot were trust, number one, safety, number two, consistency and continuity, number three. There was um, a mention of individual attention and there was a mention of being connected, feeling connected. And so I want to that's the end goal, and I want to backtrack to what happens usually initially in traumatic experiences, is there's a great deal of uncertainty. The uncertainty of whether there's enough food, the uncertainty of whether there's enough money, the uncertainty of whether mom's coming home, the uncertainty of whether a brother or sister is going to injure themselves in a way you can't help them. And that uncertainty, I think, forms the basis uh, of the discussion that's happening here today and of anxiety disorders in general. So trauma or uncertainty or neglect um, breeds an environment of distrust or uncertainty, and that's the basis of the anxiety. Move forward on that from anxiety, the next sort of arrowhead is you try and control your situation, you try and control your environment to diminish your level of anxiety. When things become stressful or uncertain, you try and put into place a certain amount of structure doing whatever Edward had to do to structure the family and make sure everyone was taken care of. The situation of a group home where there are lots of children that have been traumatized, there had to be structure in that group home. There, Mr. Jenkins had to lay down certain laws and certain values. So putting into place that sort of structure and then eventually it feels less like a controlled environment and more like a safe supported environment. And that's what a lot of children that wound up in, that wind up in, Edward being one of them, they come from an environment of total uncertainty or lack of structure. And the story I heard today is unfortunately very unique, um, but with advocates like these two guys, I, I, I think the sky's the limit. So I stay optimistic. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open, I want to spend, we have about 40 minutes left. I'd like to use half of that for questions. Um, if that gets trimmed a little bit, you know, Someone shout at me if you have questions you want to interject in between. I'm fine with that. So I'm not going to, I have probably about 20 slides. Some I may not cover at all. I'm happy to circulate this as a, as a PDF to anyone here in the audience. So don't feel like you have to take copious notes. It's just what we'll go through. Here are some numbers. And I pulled some of these numbers from a uh, justice report that was done. Some numbers from our academy's guidelines. Um, on post-traumatic stress disorder. And all this to say that probably one in four to one in three kids have experienced some sort of trauma, and maybe as many as one in seven people have experienced a sexual assault. So just to lay the groundwork that it's probably something we should all know about and we should all know how to treat. 
The last half there just, just suggests, and this is not as much what we're dealing with today, but where do kids typically access services? It may be surprising, most of them get picked up in school, and then in the age group, which we were talking about with Edward, the, the adolescent age, most of them actually get picked up in the juvenile justice system. Very few of them actually go through their primary care provider or other routes to get service. These are just a few more numbers. So since I mentioned Department of Juvenile Justice, I mean nearly all, so you could say three out of four to four out of four have experienced some sort of trauma before they're detained, and many of them have had multiple traumas. And there's, there's a direct relationship that's been established to, to children that have been traumatized and their involvement in some sort of delinquent acts. And so the idea is that treatment would preempt any treatment in a juvenile justice facility. Um, again, you know, using a lot of these slides just to make the case that the prevalence of trauma and neglect, some sort of uncertain environment, is extremely common in the foster care population. The last bullet point there talks about medication. We'll spend some time talking about medication today. And that half of all the teenage children in custody in 2009 were prescribed at least one psychotropic medicine. Another point that it's probably important to know about mental illness that results, not saying everyone has a diagnosis, suggesting maybe there's more diagnosis than actually exists sometimes. Maybe there's more medicating. You heard one story that you know, Edward was not prescribed any medications and with a safe, trusting environment didn't require any medications. These are some more, um, this is some more data about prescriptions just to say it happens a lot and maybe more than enough, maybe not enough, maybe just the right amount, um, but it's something we should all know about. So one in 20 kids were receiving four or more medications. And that younger children, so I mentioned teenage children, so these are the five to 12 year olds, younger children were only slightly less frequently prescribed. About 40% of those children, five to 12 in state care, were on some sort of medication. There's some cost numbers up there, basically just to say these medicines cost a ton of money to the state Medicaid system. And so it's another reason to know a lot about the type of care they're getting and ask questions about the type of care they're getting. Just like Mr. Jenkins alluded to, attending staffings, advocating for the children uh, is one way to ensure that they're not inappropriately medicated. And there is, there is a push sometimes to use medications as a stopgap measure until you can put community services in place. If community services don't exist, they may never be put in place, and so the medication unfortunately stays. I just listed some common disorders, okay? You'll see these disorders all over charts. Um, where's my pointer here? So bipolar being one that's seen a lot, major depressive disorder seen a lot, anxiety disorders, um, Generalized anxiety disorder or PTSD seen a lot, and then these ODD and ADHD seen a lot. I grouped them for you though because I just want to, one of the biggest take home points is to put trauma, neglect, all of that stuff in the bucket of anxiety, in the bucket of uncertainty, and how to treat the uncertainty. Whether it's from a therapeutic approach without meds or whether it's with medication, that that's what you're addressing. That unstable, uncertain, unsafe environment, and providing some stability, safety, and support for that. Okay, um, let me go through and pick out the highlights here. So again, the bucket is anxiety disorder. Think about post-traumatic stress disorder, whether the child has post-traumatic stress disorder or only has several symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, think about it as an anxiety disorder. That you have to have something, in order to diagnose this, so in Edward's case, again, I don't know a lot of the history, there has to be some precipitating event. You can't say a child and treat a child for PTSD if there's no event, no trauma. So the problem with this is getting a trauma history out of a child is incredibly hard. The emotional vocabulary that a child has is not near the same as the emotional vocabulary we have. We can talk about being embarrassed or humiliated or frustrated or elated. Most children can't do that. And so a lot of their emotions are presented through behavior. And so then you're left with behaviors trying to guess, is there anxiety for a certain reason? Did they have a trauma? What's this anxiety about? What's this behavior about? Is this even anxiety? Are they depressed? And I'm not big on a lot of handouts, and that's why I didn't put these in the handout packet, but uh, the second and third pages of what you have, I provided because it's a checklist of PTSD symptoms, not for clinicians, but for parents. 
And I would view a lot of you as having a role of a surrogate parent, which we already heard from Mr. Jenkins, that he took that role and he's called Pops today. And so some of those things listed there are ways in which tr trauma can manifest itself, <laughs> different symptoms and different behaviors that children can have. And so I wanted you all to be aware of those and take a look at those at your leisure and ask questions about it during our question um, session when I finish, or if you have questions, just raise your hand as we're going through. The other point that I'll make as we go through here is that a lot of those symptoms or behaviors on there will remind you of other disorders. They'll remind you of depression. They'll remind you of bipolar disorder. They'll remind you of oppositional behavior. They'll remind you of conduct disordered behavior. They'll remind you of ADHD. And so I want to focus on a few slides where I talk about symptom overlap between children with trauma and children with a whole host of other disorders where the other disorders are clearly diagnosed and treated but the trauma may be missed because those symptoms are overlapping. Um, these are most, this is mostly coming from just our diagnostic criteria. Um, this detachment dissociation I'll talk a little bit more about. I put this in here. This is the typical uh, Kubler-Ross mechanism of dealing with loss or grief. And some of these go, go very much in hand with traumatic environments or neglectful environments that there's sort of a denial for a while that it's happening and you, uh, you know, make the parents are the best thing that you've got and you really want them around and even though they're not doing the best job, you sort of deny it and move along and go with it. There's some fear and helplessness that comes next. Anger is the next step and this, this bargaining step isn't really part of PTSD. This is where you say, eh, it's not that bad, I'll tolerate it. So again, it's not really existing. I hate that it's existing. I can tolerate it a little bit longer. This really stinks that this is existing. And the question for you know, a, tra a traumatic environment is do you ever get to the acceptance phase and how do you get to the acceptance that yes, I was treated like this, yes, this was the environment I lived in, but it can be different and I can experience something different. And that's, the, that's sort of the safety support argument I want to make um, in this talk today. Mm. Oh, I put this last thing here. So avoidance is a hallmark symptom, right? There are three symptoms. You have to get startled easily, you have to avoid memories of a trauma, and you have to um, have it re-experienced in some way, nightmares or memories of the event. Because avoidance is one of the hallmark features, it's hard to elicit the trauma again. Another reason you have the checklist. Then, so you try and go collateral history, try and get some information from the parents. Did this trauma happen? There's a risk that parents will even deny it or avoid telling you about it for, again, a whole host of reasons. And that if you have any evidence at all, any other third party, any collateral, any medical illness that they had as a result, so you look at a lot of this in neonatal patients that may have some brain injury because they were traumatized at home, any evidence to suggest trauma should prompt at least some questions about a child's safety, a child's behavior changing abruptly around a sentinel event. These are some other things associated here. The regressive behaviors I put on here for sure. This can come in any, any sort of uh, behavior that you can imagine along the human development structure. So kids not being able to sit or stand and so they crawl. Um, children not using appropriate speech for their age, so kids using infantile speech. Um, the clinging behavior, so having not moved past the separation anxiety. So any of these regressive behaviors, which you heard talked about already, can happen in any child, not necessarily one who has a diagnosable disorder, any child that's been abused, neglected, traumatized in some way. Physical symptoms are another one, right? Could the, could the child's headache or stomach ache represent some sort of trauma? Could a visit to a doctor by a child represent some sort of indication that they need help from a physician. They don't know any other way to get help other than to complain that they're sick. They need to stay home from school. They need to go see a doctor. Um, we'll talk about this in overlap, but the irritability or extreme emotional reactions that come along with this, difficulty sleeping goes with a ton of other diagnoses. Um, I don't need to go through each of those individually. Um, all right. More stuff about PTSD. The highlight and the positive note here is that only about 30% after, after kids experience a trauma, only about one in three will have persistent symptoms. Again, still be asking about it in a broad assessment, but the good news is that two out of three make it out of traumatic experiences without having symptoms. The one out of three, and the, and the population we're talking about today that wind up in foster care or state custody, 
will usually wind up in this chronic PTSD diagnosis because trauma is repeated and that trauma is unavoidable and uncertainty is unavoidable. You have change in placements, change in surrogate parents. Is your safety guaranteed? Will you be physically or sexually abused in your new placement? Who knows? And so the PTSD changes or anxiety changes from a sentinel event, a one-time event, my grandmother died, or I saw my parents beat each other up, or I was touched by a cousin, to this has now happened three, four, five, six times. As I was alluding before, they've looked at Department of Juvenile Justice populations, and most of those kids have experienced, that have experienced one trauma have experienced multiple traumas before they get detained the first time. Um, yeah, and this is readable. I want to highlight this stuff so we have some time for questions as well. How common is PTSD and how much are you seeing it diagnosed? So really, it's probably 1 in 10 to 20 kids in the adolescent population. You will likely see this on psychological reports much more often than 1 in 10 to 20 kids that you deal with. It's a unique population. This is general epidemiology, general statistics. Um, some associated behaviors, again, again, another take home point other than this is anxiety bucket, uncertainty bucket, is that there are tons of behaviors that children will uh, demonstrate that will not be their verbalization of I was traumatized, but will represent I'm scared, I'm in an uncertain, scary environment, I need help. They don't sleep well, they have nightmares, they injure themselves to avoid the painful emotional experience of reliving that trauma. So again, you have these repeated memories that you can't get out of your mind, it's so disturbing that I'll do anything to get out of this emotional despair that it's going to happen again. So a self-injurious behavior to avoid the, avoid the feelings that go along with tr being traumatized. Some illicit drug use. Yes, it may be normal adolescent behavior to experiment with alcohol and drugs. The nature of that drug use, the, the age at which the drug use starts, the severity of the drug use may represent a traumatic experience that had happened. Some indiscriminate sexual behavior may happen after kids have been sexually abused or otherwise traumatized. Um, and I listed some comorbidi comorbidities. All comorbidities means is other, dis other disorders that go along with post-traumatic stress disorder. So you're likely to see mood disorders, whether it's bipolar disorder or major depressive disorder or other depressive disorders. Um, you're likely to see, uh, when we talked about control earlier, some kids develop such routines around control that they actually develop a, a pretty clear obsessive compulsive disorder that they have to do things compulsively the same way because otherwise there's so much uncertainty in their life. And substance use disorders, which I already mentioned uh, before. I put some mitigating factors, some things that can make maybe a trauma better or worse or give you a sense of whether the kid is going to prognostically do better or worse. Um, I listed here panic symptoms immediately following exposure. So if you see a kid that has mm, major body type symptoms, racing heart, headaches, sweating, shortness of breath, nausea, diarrhea, anything like that when they have memories of a trauma, it's probably an indicator that their experience of that trauma and the anxiety that goes along with it will be worse than a child that doesn't have those symptoms. Um, the, the next two points just say we don't know whether I don't think there's a ton of clear evidence around whether immediate intervention after a trauma is, some people think it's harmful. And not all studies say it's harmful to intervene immediately. I think, again, the safety, support, certain, loving, consistent environment um, says more than whether it's done on day one or day 30 after the trauma. Um, I, I, meant, I alluded to this a little bit before. Uh, whether there's a diagnosis that's separate of complex post-traumatic stress disorder. So you have very early trauma during early brain development in the first two years. You have very severe trauma, and I'm sure many of you have heard stories about severe early trauma. And interpersonal trauma, so actually, you know, between you and another person rather, rather than just witnessing trauma. So those would be some other factors that may make the seriousness worse. So I took the next two slides to talk about symptom overlap. I think it's really important because the, so restlessness can be a hallmark symptom of a generalized anxiety disorder, even in adults. You get sort of restless, have to stay busy. If I stop being busy, I'll think about things I don't want to think about. That restlessness in kids is easily attributed to ADHD, easily. Hallmark symptom. Runs like a motor, runs around the classroom, restless, can't sit still. So you get on a stimulant. Nobody knows you were traumatized, you won't get on the proper medicine or you won't get the proper therapy, whichever arm you choose. 
Um, some disorganized play, poor concentration, all of that going in with classic anxiety symptoms and difficulty sleeping. Another hallmark symptom of anxiety in kids and adults. They don't sleep well. Whether they're having nightmares or not, they don't sleep well. Anxious kids don't sleep well. Anxious adults don't sleep well. Oppositional defiant disorder often gets attributed to kids. You don't need much to qualify for an oppositional defiant disorder diagnosis. <laughs> there are plenty of adults that meet the criteria for oppositional <laughs> defiant disorder. The good news is from a medication arm, for those of you that are pretty conservative about meds, um, like I would consider myself to be, is that there are no indicated medications for oppositional defiant disorder. So just if your child gets a diagnosis of oppositional defiant disorder, they may be more difficult to treat. They may be what you would call your friend's difficult child. They don't respect authority. They don't listen when they're told to do something. Most children in state custody have a lot of reasons to be oppositional. So I, wouldn't, I wouldn't get too scared if you see the label and just know that there are reasons for this. There are no indicated medications for it. You know, we'll deal with it. We'll deal with it. Unnecessary label follows the child throughout the system, from placement to placement, and so that's a problem. It, it is a problem. Um, it is a problem. And I think if you, I guess the only, the only highlight of that is that if I were going to take a diagnosis that would follow somebody and say it needs to be so aggressively treated, I might rather have oppositional defiant disorder than bipolar disorder. I might rather have oppositional defiant disorder than conduct disorder. <laughs> Right, because people think of conduct disordered children as criminals or soon to be incarcerated. I might rather have oppositional defiant disorder than, than a major depressive episode, actually. I, mean, I do agree that having a mental health diagnosis is stigmatizing and can make it very difficult to achieve a permanent placement. Um, you know, they're looking at different ways to classify diagnoses in the, DS in the next diagnostic manual, which will probably, it's probably three years from now, two and a half years from now, but developmental approaches to, to bipolar disorder. And I can, I think Sherry's going to circulate some things. I can circulate that article, but the APA has come out with a statement about how, how they're going to change those diagnoses and make them more developmentally appropriate. I can't get rid of ODD. I don't know, where it's, I don't know what's going to happen to that, um, but I agree it's an unfortunate. Other anxiety disorders, so kids may be social, ang anxious in social situations or have panic symptoms. I'm just, just making the point that these overlap. More symptom overlap. We talked about the last one already. Kids use alcohol and drugs maybe more when they've been traumatized. Uh, again, I would, I would equate using alcohol and drugs to the indiscriminate sexual behavior, to the self-injurious behavior, all activities that kids can do to avoid the unpleasant emotional experience of re-experiencing their trauma or thinking about their trauma. Depressive disorders and bipolar disorder both falling in a mood disorder category. Another take home point that I make is that bipolar disorder is not a behavior disorder. So the reason I put here, I put disruptive behavior disorders at the bottom here. Bipolar disorder is not a disruptive behavior disorder. Bipolar disorder is not diagnosed solely on behavior. Bipolar disorder is a mood disorder and it should be thought of as such. You must have the two poles of moods, euphoric, or depressed. The problem is that there's a modifier around euphoria for mania of irritability. And we've already talked about, I put under there, that irritability in children with trauma can mimic bipolar disorder. There's, there can be restlessness. It can be perceived as oppositional defiant disorder. So it would be easy to make the link that ODD, ADHD, and bipolar disorder could all be mistaken. I'm not saying that every child that is diagnosed with those disorders has had a trauma or has PTSD, just that there's a lot of symptom overlap here. I think I've mentioned most of what's on there. So I took the next three slides. We'll change to treatment arms um, and what would be appropriate treatments, what you're looking for, and when to question treatment that kids are getting from providers. Most of, so, the other thing I'll go through is how to find practice parameters from the Child Psychiatric Association. They are written for the general public. They are probably 10 to 12 pages in length, and they go through the different standards that they have for efficacy to suggest a treatment. Trauma-focused uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is TFCBT, is this and a group format of the same are the two treatments that have received the most what's called randomized controlled trial data meaning you take a group that has 
uh, uh, PTSD diagnosis and you take a kid, group of kids that does not have a PTSD diagnosis, or you take two groups of kids that have PTSD, you treat one with standard care, sort of child-centered psychotherapy, and you treat one with this trauma-focused therapy, and these kids that receive a type of manualized therapy actually do better than those that receive treatment as usual in the community. Um, I, wanna, I wanna spend some time actually going through what these are. Um, and the other, the other big things that um, are mentioned as far as efficacious treatments, the parents must be involved, and so if the parents are unavailable, I think surrogate parents, or in this case, defects employees must be involved in the treatment in some way, shape, or form, um, or, or the most consistent parental figure. So whether it's the defects case manager or a social worker at the group home, it doesn't matter. There needs to be some consistent person, adult figure, involved in the treatment. And that the other, which we heard about before, the developmental level of functioning, that the idea is to allow children that have had major trauma and are functioning developmentally much lower than where they should be to elevate them back to a normal, de normal developmental level. So there aren't as many problems in school, there aren't as many problems with peers, there aren't as many problems with social relationships. And again, when it comes to self-esteem, which Mr. Jenkins mentioned earlier, getting kids back up to that normal level of functioning is important. So with, I didn't want to just say trauma-focused CBT and say, you know, this is the treatment without saying sort of what the, so the acronym there, practice, are the um, hallmarks of that treatment. So I'll just focus on that I, in vivo mastery. So the idea is that you're going to anticipate traumatic experiences coming back up in your mind. It's gonna happen. You're gonna remember your trauma. If you're nervous or anxious about it already, it's gonna pop back in. You're gonna see something on TV, a kid at school is gonna talk about something, something will inevitably probably remind you of that trauma. And so this therapeutic approach would teach children ways to gently expose themselves to something that they know will remind them of the trauma and deal with the anxiety that results from it. So the in vivo mastery is saying, it's going to exist, Let's just take that as an accepted fact. Let's put you in an experience after several weeks or months of treatment. Let's put you in an experience gently with some support where you know you're going to be anxious and let's deal with what happens together in a therapeutic approach. The rest um, this is self-explanatory, so teaching parents and kids about trauma, teaching them self-relaxation techniques, teaching them ways affective modulation skills are actually reminds you of DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, which some of you may know about. Um, it's a treat indicated treatment for some personality symptoms. Um, cognitive coping, this is really just restructuring the way you think about your trauma, encouraging kids later on to write a narrative about their trauma. The in vivo mastery is what we already talked about, having joint sessions with the parents. And again, the last thing, this future safety. And it, Assuring kids and promising kids safety in a state custody system is difficult, and just take that as a known fact, but as much as you can do individually to advocate for that safe, consistent, caring environment will go, will go miles beyond, or, or at least what therapeutic approaches do or medication does. Seeking safety is something I hear about that's used a lot in residential facilities. It's a manualized treatment. There's a little bit of evidence for it that I put it up here. Um, it's really for use in people that have a comorbid substance use disorder, and that's how it's structured. It can be done in an individual or group way. Um, the efficacy of this is a real small study of adolescent girls that said it, it was more effective than treatment as usual. But it is a, seeking safety is a manual you'll hear about if you have kids receiving PTSD treatment in residential facilities in the state. Um, treatment recommendations, so there's a lot on this slide. Take home points would be right here, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy versus trauma-focused therapy plus a medication, sertraline or Zoloft. Randomized controlled trial. So the kids in this arm got sugar pill, placebo, and there were similar treatment outcomes in kids that just received therapy or that received therapy plus medication. Now, I say this in the context that there's not a lot of data on kids. It's the biggest shortfall we have. We haven't tested a lot of medications in kids. We don't know what a lot of medications do in kids. The FDA hasn't granted approval for medication in kids. So the lack of research or the lack of medication to show superiority doesn't mean it doesn't work, 
but it also doesn't mean it does work. So we shouldn't necessarily shy too far away, but given this data, we shouldn't jump to medication before we've tried a therapeutic approach first. There are, so when I talked about qualities of evidence, there's sort of a lower level of evidence and some efficacy in very small studies, talking 20 to 30 to 40 patients, for citalopram, Celexa, and fluoxetine, Prozac. Um, the, the times when you may consider using a medication at the first or second assessment is when it's clear that there's a major depressive episode. It's clear that there are major <laughs> other anxiety symptoms, so obsessive compulsive disorder or generalized anxiety disorder. Or it's clear what we talked about earlier, very early trauma, very severe trauma, very significant anxiety and an interpersonal nature to the trauma. Um, the other thing I'll mention off of here is that medications in general can be activating. So SSRIs is the group of medications, Prozac, Zoloft, Selexa, Lexapro, Paxil, that group of the world. They can actually be activating a little bit. That was the, uh, some of what came out in the black box warning around those medicines around suicide risk is that they can be activating in some way. One of the hallmark symptoms of PTSD or traumatic diagnosis is a state of hyperarousability. You get activated very easily already. Small things trigger a major body response. And so if you're one of those kids that has an activating experience with a medication that's supposed to be treating your disorder, it may actually make it worse either initially or that activating effect may never go away. So something to, something to look for or know about. Um, I just put the bottom line there that unless there are mitigating factors, severe trauma, early trauma, major anxiety uh, symptoms, or one of these other diagnoses, that re you'd really be hard pressed to say why you were using medication before you had used therapy. Okay, now I listed all the types of medicines because I'm going to get to a slide here in a little bit where I talk about medication, more than one medication from the same class. So I only put this up here to have you think about medications as classes of medications. Not because you need to know all of them, um, but if you were to notice that there were two medicines in the same class, which would theoretically be used for the same disorder, you might ask, why are you using two instead of one? Just might ask the question to the doctor. So we'll get to some questions that might be appropriate as well. Um, I only put up here SSRIs and SS SNRIs. SSRI stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. All that means is that it prevents some vacuum cleaners from going out in your brain and sucking up a bunch of serotonin so more serotonin hangs around. Higher serotonin, improved mood. That's why these medicines are used for mood and anxiety disorders is that the data behind using them is that more serotonin d diminishes levels of anxiety and improves mood. What are the asterisks? The asterisks I put in at the last minute to let you know that these are the only two medicines indicated by the FDA for treatment of adult PTSD. FDA indication is a weird thing, right? A company has to go out and pay a lot of money to get a sample of people and say, you all have PTSD. We're going to put some of you on a sugar pill and some of you on our new medicine, and the new medicine has to be better than the sugar pill. You have to do that twice successfully. You can fail 10 times, but you have to do that twice successfully. Once you've done that, you can get an indication. My hunch is that the newer medicines that have come out, and I said is an older, the newer medicines that have come out Doctors may extrapolate that if a medicine in the same class that works by a very similar mechanism got this indication, we may also have some benefit there and maybe physicians will use it without the indication. So FDA indication is not, you know, gold standard, but it does give you some sense that there has been some research done. It doesn't tell you whether 20% of the studies were positive or 100% of the studies were positive for efficacy. It just tells you that there's FDA approval. No. The, the medications here that have an indicated use for children are the first one and two. There's some indication for adolescents with Lexapro now. The most data is up here around Prozac and Zoloft, uh, different ages seven and eight, or the cutoffs used in the studies, indication for obsessive compulsive disorder with Zoloft. Um, no indication, no indication, no indication, adolescence indication here. Um, none of these are indicated for PTSD in children. But the most data we have of any of the two medicines are these two right here. 
right. medical person. Right. Does that mean that we are giving our children yes. medication that no? Does that mean that we're giving our children medication that has not been approved to be used on children? Okay, so this gets into a discussion. Yes. The answer to your question is yes. Um, do you want me to elaborate? <laughs> um, it's not FDA approved. So now you get into, I want you to think of a two-pronged approach. FDA approved or standard of care. I use this metaphor. Is, is are soft drinks approved by uh, TANF or food stamp monies for good health, or is it standard? Or are certain foods approved for good health, right? So the approval doesn't exist. Well, the approval came first. They're allowed to make those foods and sell those foods to, to people. I mean, the approval of those foods by the agency that says you can market this to people and Correct. sell it, that you, did happen. And you cannot market these to kids, right. the ones that are not indicated. So, so you have FDA approval, which says you can go out and market these things to children. And then you have standard practice, which is what physicians decide to do in their best judgment. And the second part of what I heard you say is that even if it's standard of care, no, it's not even indicated that these things actually affect our children in the ways that they're being used. Is that what I heard you say, the second uh, part? Uh, the only two indicated for PTSD in adults are the ones with STARS. So that means those drug companies went out and got an FDA indication. Yes, people with a traumatic mental illness or a mental illness as a result of trauma got better on those two medicines. Physicians for adults may extrapolate that data and say, well, well you know, if you failed one of these indicated treatments, we'll try one that hasn't been indicated but works similarly and it may help you. And if, I mean, that's second line and then third line, right? So theoretically, we should be going, what's the first line agent? Try that. If that doesn't work, go to another agent maybe in the class. And then third line, maybe go out of the class, right? And that you could equate that to Tylenol and Motrin for people's headaches, right? Maybe Tylenol is thought to work better, but Motrin works better or Aleve works better for some people. That there's good data here, research data. And there's some other anecdotal data on all these medicines helping. Anecdotal just means people report it, that it works. Um, and all of them working, but the only two indicated are the ones I put there. There are none of them that are indicated in kids. We don't have a lot of research on kids. Is it to say you should let a child who was severely traumatized for two years of his early life and continues to be traumatized and has significant anxiety, should you withhold a medication that has been shown to be helpful in adults? You've tried therapy. The anxiety is overwhelming. It's debilitating in some way. They're not sleeping at night, they're not paying attention to their hygiene, they're cutting themselves, they're having indiscriminate sex and using IV <coughs> drugs. Let's take a really severe case. Should you withhold a medication that should, and they're 15, should you withhold a medication that was tested in 18 plus from that child thinking that there are, there are enough similarities in that brain development that it may help them? Not saying it will, not saying there's been a study around it. Should you withhold it? And that are you doing more harm by withholding a, a, a treatment that has shown benefit in adults? I will not say that there aren't medications prescribed indiscriminately. I won't make that statement either. Right, that, that does happen too. So you can either be, I think you can be too conservative, too aggressive, or fall out somewhere in the middle. And I would just, as long as there's some coherent thought process that someone can explain to you as to why they're doing it, and I don't know that you have to necessarily agree or disagree, I mean, you don't necessarily have to agree with it, but it should make sense about why they're doing it. Uh-huh, go ahead. And I want to make sure I understand the terms you're using to child, adolescent, and adult. Are, are child and adolescent different age groups? Can you, mm. based on the studies you're talking about, and yeah. what age groups have been tested? Mm. I, I'm not clear on that. The index, so you have, this medicine, Lexapro, has been tested in, so I'll break, children I say 12 and younger, adolescents I say 13 and up. 18? 17, 18, yeah. Uh, Lexapro was tested down to 13 for its indication. Zoloft was tested down to 7 or 8, 7, I believe, and Prozac down to 8. Prozac had some use in eating disorders. Zoloft has use in OCD. Um, these two don't have any data that I'm aware of, in data in kids, but no indications in kids. Yeah. So 
So when I say children and adolescents, I guess I'm trying to make a broad point that there's not a lot of data on medicines. It's only a few that are indicated on, uh, for kids from a governmental level. And that we have to tolerate a little bit of ambiguity around these medicines that maybe they're helpful, maybe they're harmful. If they're harmful, we better advocate to make sure our child doesn't continue to take those medicines. And if they're helpful as they have been proven to be helpful in adults, it's probably not worth withholding that treatment. But anyone in here who says, yes, the kids are prescribed medicines that aren't approved with the stamp of approval from the FDA would be absolutely correct. There are hardly any of them. I didn't put all the medicines up here. There are some newer medicines. Risperdal got an indication for use in autism, uh, ag aggression in autistic kids, aggression and irritability down to age five. Um, some of the newer antipsychotics, Seroquel, Abilify, Zyprexa, have gone out and gotten indications for use in bipolar disorder as well, down to 13, some down to 10. Um, so there exists some indication data. That's newer. So. So in, in the testing, do they look at not only whether the medication helps a certain condition, do they also contrast side effects in children versus side effects mm. in adults? <clears throat> because if you look at some of the warnings on these medications, it can cause suicidal tendencies, for example. Right. I mean, do they look at whether there, there is an increased incident of that mm -hmm. for the younger populations versus the older populations, or are they just looking at this seems to help <coughs> condition X? Right. They're required, to, they're required to report side effects and the frequencies of side effects. Um, in all, so the package insert, which you may get when you get a medicine at the pharmacy, it's an extremely small font. You can find that, identic, you can find that identical stuff online, publicly available package insert. And there's a whole section that goes through the side effects. It says, you know, in the sugar pill group, it happened in 4% of patients, and in the active treatment arm, it happened in 5 or 6%. When there's a big discrepancy, they're required to highlight that. And if it's a big enough discrepancy, that's when you get the worst warning from the FDA, the black box. No one wants a black box on their medicine because everybody gets concerned about prescribing it. So the suicidal thinking, you might be referring to the black box that's on all antidepressant medications, all medicines that act on serotonin, about an increase in suicidal thinking. Two-fold increase, 4% versus 2%. No completed suicides. Important to know that. Um, and important to know is a broad sample on all of these different medications looking at, uh, I wish to die, I wish I wasn't here, uh, I think about cutting myself, I hope to die in my sleep, I'm going to hang myself tomorrow. Any number of suicidal gestures, suicidal threats, suicidal behaviors, suicidal thinking was classified in that black box. So the Child Psychiatry Association came out with a recommendation that anyone you're going to start on a SSRI, you should see back the next week. And then you should see back week two. And then you should see back week four. You should continue to see this kid regularly in the first month. Now whether that's possible with our network of child psychiatrists in Georgia, probably not. And whether it's possible for the DFAX providers that take Georgia Medicaid, also probably not. There should be a mechanism, I think, for all of you to ask a question, is this appropriate, if you can't get them back into a physician. I think that's reasonable. Is this appropriate treatment? The reason pediatricians and the reason SSRIs went way down in prescribing after that black box came out is because pediatricians also don't have time and, and aren't really trained as such to see a kid back every week or two and then do a psychiatric assessment. So seeing a kid, back three, seeing a kid on Georgia Medicaid back three times in a month in a pediatrician's office just because you started them on a medication because they were horribly depressed after you name it, or they have been depressed for two years and it finally came to their attention, and they say, we'll try a, a small dose of a medicine, and I'll refer you to a psychiatrist. We got really leery about doing that. And so then the question came, are we withholding treatment from some kids? We might be saving some kids from over-medication, but are we actually withholding treatment because there's this big black box warning now? Is it well enough understood? Okay, <clears throat> here are a couple things, a uh, couple of times I would always ask. So if, for example, a kid was on Prozac and Zoloft, two medicines from that same class, I would always ask, can you just tell me, you know, I think they're both used to treat the same things, they both do the same thing, they both act similar ways, can you tell me why you're using both? Same thing goes, I put SNRIs up here, Effexor, Pristique, and Cymbalta, Pristique is super new and a uh, newer version of Effexor, no indication in kids. 
no indication in kids, no indication in kids, no indication in kids over here either. Um, it's hard. Um, at the end, I'll pu at the end I'll pull it up. Well, or at the end, but I'll pull it up. I'll show you how to how I search for package inserts and then how to make sense of it here real quick. Um, did I miss a question? We just been here on this game here. Well, about. Well, there was another question before. How do you? Oh, so the FDA indication I'll show you here in a minute. There was a question before about what's effective and safe. So more than one in, <coughs> in one class, I think, is incredibly important. Um, and then if they're on more than three, I mean, I some states say more than four, and I learned this morning that Texas actually doesn't pick people up until they have more than five, five or more. So different states do it in different ways about when it becomes concerning, and they're usually consensus panels of physicians and treating providers that come up with these, you know, reasons to be concerned. I put less than six years on there for all medications. Stimulants might be the exception because there is some safety data, at least down to three in those. No indication down to three, but some safety data. Um, less than 10 years for antipsychotics, that would be all of your Risperdal, Zyprexa, Seroquel, Abilify, Geodon, which has no indication in kids, um, Safras, Phenapt. Any, any antipsychotic less than 10, there's not a lot of data except in the autistic population for Risperdal. Um, and then I would ask questions. I mean, if they're having major side effects, the last two things on there, you should definitely ask about the medication choice. Um, I want to pull up these three, which Sherry tells me she'll distribute by email. These are facts for families that we put out, again, I think very easily written. And there's a three-part series about why medications are prescribed. The third part in this series gives you very appropriate questions to ask a treating provider. And these are also accessible free on the web, on the ACAP website, AACAP, American Association of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, AACAP.org. But these are all the questions they advocate, psychiatric medication for children and adolescents, questions to ask. What's the name? Is it known by other names, right, to get around the generic and trade name? What's known about whether it helps kids like mine? How will it help? What are the side effects? What are the serious ones? Is it addictive? What's the dosage? Are there lab tests? These are, and these should be asked in a very, you know, like you would want to be asked about some part of your job, right, in a sort of non-confrontational way, but an inquisitive way. You're curious. You don't know. You're not, I mean, this isn't what you do all day, right? You should just ask. Um, I will, so these will all go out by email. I think Sherry said she can send these three out by email. And then I'll just show you how I search really quickly for a package insert. So if you have, if you have some curiosity around, uh, well, I don't know why, I, why I'm gonna pick one over the other, but. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I'll pick Seroquel for example. I typed in, oh, that may not have come up. It should, .pi for package insert. And it may, you may be able to just search for PI. PI stands for package insert. So this is a bigger version of what you get in your pharmacy bag in the small font. You can make this as large as you like so you can read it. Um, all right, so what this does is it should give you the most recent package insert, which is required to be approved by the FDA. The very first part is what has changed recently and you see there, they got, there's the boxed warning, the first one on there. That's the black box. It got a boxed warning for suicidality and, and, and antidepressant drugs, which is listed right here, because it actually went out and got an indication for use in bipolar, in bipolar depression, which is down here. So they have a black box on there. They tell you everything else that changed. They went out and got an indication for schizophrenia, for bipolar, Bipolar 1, all of these, and it tells you when the most recent change was and what section of this package insert it details the change. And here's your home run indications and usage, okay? It's indicated for the treatment of schizophrenia in adults, and it established that in six-week trials. So there were three trials, different trials, for six weeks each, and it was better in adults than a sugar pill. In adolescents from 13 to 17, there was one trial done. 
Once you have an indication in adults, you only need one trial to get the indication in kids. That's because the FDA says, well, we don't have a lot of research in kids, and if you've proven efficacy in adults, we'll only require one positive trial in kids. Don't forget, you can have as many negative trials as you want. There was this big hoopla about drug companies hiding all their negative results, which are now made to be public, but you only need one positive. You can fail many times, you need one positive trial. So this is how I find it. You can find it like this on any drug. It may be harder on the generic medications that are no longer marketed to find it, but you can find it if you, if you fish. Package insert, name of the drug, first section indications and usage. And then if you actually go down here to say adolescence 14.1, hmm, clinical studies, it will detail for you what they did. Adults, they should have a separate house applied. I don't see it right now, but it should be in 14.1 where they say it is. I'll get back to you on that. It should be where they say it is, and they ha they're required to say what they did and how they proved that it works. So I don't see it now. The website I was telling you about where you can get a, a practice parameters is the ACAP, ACAP.org. That's the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Rather than fishing around the site, it's probably easiest just to type in practice parameters. They changed their site recently. So if I looked up PTSD ACAP, practice parameters, wow. there it is. Now, I, uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, this is not, okay. So once you get here is what you, Oh, here's what you're looking for, this page, practice parameters. Down here on every single diagnosis you can imagine, there's a statement from ACAP about proper screening, evaluation, and treatment. ADHD, anxiety disorders, in general, autism, bipolar disorder. And they're updated every 10 to 12 years. You see most of these have been done in 2000s. The PTSD actually was just updated in April of this year. You click on it and it opens a PDF document. You can, I mean, you could do trainings around these, um, but it's, you know, what did we do? What's, what's the methods? How do we know about what's done? How does it present in kids? How is it treated? I was telling you earlier about they come up with MS means minimal standard. And they describe what a minimal standard is. You know, what's the threshold for being recommended? More than 95% of the time, almost all cases. So if you have a treating provider that's not following some minimal standard in here, that would concern you. Randomized controlled trials being the gold standard. It's really written in a very friendly way to explain general practice parameters for treatments of any disorder you can imagine. So I think they're very helpful. Um, we've talked about doing maybe another one of these to talk more about medication if people have more questions. Um, are, but I've really enjoyed Inching being closer. here, and thanks for all the good questions. I do, I do want, I have to interject. I have the difficult job of ending our program just because we've run over time. You can tell that Brent and the rest of our speakers make this job very hard because I think that they've given you a lot of information um, and motivated you a lot to look further into some of these issues. So please join me in thanking them one more time, all of them. Dr. Cooper, <laughs> Jacob, come back to the room. I do want to quickly uh, remind you about the evaluations and the parking validation, which you'll need. You can take care of all of that at the desk around the corner. And then a final reminder about our next Child Welfare Legal Academy, which will be January 11th with uh, Pat O'Brien, and I hope that you can join us then. Thank you so much.